can see clearly now the rain is gone I can see all obstacles in my way Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind It's gonna be a bright, bright What up, tubers? It's me. You know who I am or you wouldn't be here. So Mike is somewhere right now, which means <clears throat> at any moment he's going to pull into the driveway and light this up and uh, interrupt and I'll have to start from scratch or remember where I'm at. But he put out a video today, I think. I think somebody was asking about a first firearm and it got me thinking. His answer at the end was uh, your first firearm should be a handgun and I agree with that because um, for the same reasons he mentioned um, about them being concealable you can take them pretty much anywhere um, obviously you're gonna want to comply with your local laws and all uh, here we're fortunate we have constitutional carry so if you can legally own a firearm you can carry it concealed no questions asked there's some other things about having a handgun. Um, one thing, again, I would recommend not going with the revolver. Revolvers, it has its pluses, but it just doesn't have enough rounds. It's slow to reload, and there's no point in getting proficient with a revolver and then getting a semi-automatic next and then having to learn the mechanics of the gun because they're completely different. You're starting from scratch all over again to learn how a semi-auto works compared to a revolver so I would say start with the semi-automatic that way you don't have to relearn everything from scratch once you upgrade to a semi-automatic um, we'll get back to the handguns there's some other things to consider well I can do that now um, so handguns like I said there's semi-automatic and revolver I recommend the semi-automatic but, but the semi-automatics come in generally three sizes. You've got your full size, your compact, and your subcompact. If you go with Glock, which is the most well-known, most famous of uh, all handguns, you've got the Glock 17, which is full size. You've got the Glock 19, which is, I think, probably the most popular handgun in the United States. That's considered a compact. And then you've got the Glock 26, which is a subcompact. Now, these, those are all the 9mm classes, so I'm sticking with that. So you've got the 17, the 19, and the 26. Um, by comparison, I have this, uh, this is a Taurus PT247 G2. Uh, this would be considered a full size, so on the level of a Glock 17, um, which is what I owned when I had a Glock. It was a Glock 17, full size Glock. Uh, the PT247 is uh, ambidextrous, so I've actually got the controls on both sides so I can manipulate the safety and the mag release left-handed whereas uh, and it also it has the rail so if you want things like a laser light or a tactical light you need a gun with, uh, with the rail system on it uh, so this would be considered a compact this is a Smith & Wesson SD9 VE so this would be the equivalent of say a Glock 19 so I don't know if you can tell there's not a big difference but the Taurus is a little bit larger of a frame I think the Glock 17 and 19 the differences are much more uh, obvious because I'm not totally sure if the SD9 VE is considered a compact or a full size but it is just a little bit smaller footprint than the, the Taurus. And then you've got the subcompact, which this is a Taurus PT111 G2. Um, again, only my PT247 G2 is ambidextrous. I'm left-handed, so I have to deal with uh, using uh, right-handed controls with my left hand which uh, this, I believe this uh, magazine release can be switched to the other side. 
which would obviously make it easier. The way it is now, I have to use my middle finger to pop that out. I don't like that because anything that interferes with my sight picture or my index finger being near the trigger, if I have to do something weird, it, it takes, you have to re reestablish your grip. Whereas if it's on the right side, if it was ambidextrous, um, I could do all the manipulation here while keeping my sight picture without being kind of awkward. But it is what it is. Left-handed firearms or ambidextrous firearms are uh, more difficult to come by and most people are right-handed, so that's probably not going to be an issue with you. But when it is ambidextrous, I can manipulate things without messing with my sight picture or moving my trigger finger. So that's something to consider, but for most people it won't be an issue. One thing you'll need to learn about a semi-automatic pistol in regards to the mechanics. Uh, some have a round indicator. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. See this part here that sticks up? You can feel it without looking. You can just put your finger over it and you know you have one in the chamber. So, but my Smith & Wesson does not have a round indicator. So I can't just feel it and know that there's a round in there. To do that, I need to actually look. This one is not fully loaded, so now it is, but there's no indicator here to tell me that. I would have to do what's called a press check, where some of these handguns have a serrated uh, edge here up on the front, so you can actually get a grip, and you can just take a look. You'll see in there, you see the round, it's loaded. So that's where a lot of negligent discharges come from. Somebody goes like this, and they go, it's unloaded, don't worry about it. Well. It's not. Now it is. And again, now you would double check. It's unloaded. But the uh, one in the chamber, that's where it gets people. So again, you're going to want to learn the mechanics of a semi-auto because they're a lot different from a revolver. On a revolver, you just pop out the, 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 the gun. I think it's the gun wheel. The wheel gun. So I guess they call it the wheel. You release the wheel. It comes out, and you can visually see there's no rounds in it. Uh, Semi-autos are a little bit different. Again, with the uh, PT-111, it's got the round indicator. I can just feel it right now. I know that it's it's got a, a round. It's ready to go. If I pull the trigger, it's going to fire. So if I do this and say, oh, I, it's unloaded here. No. So you do need to make sure that it's clear. So that is handguns. Now we're going to move on to uh, long guns, rifles, shotguns. The easiest long gun as far as mechanics is, the, is what would be called a bolt gun. Uh, this is my Remington 30-06. They're very simple. You basically look, there's no round indicator. They're very simple. There's a magazine well here. I think it's a four plus one. So you visually have to look to clear it. It has a thumb safety. Generally, when the safety is back towards you, it's on safe. And when you push it forward, it's on fire. Um, check with your gun, but generally that's the rule. Is that safe? That's fire. So can't pull the trigger. Can pull the trigger. And normally when you haven't cycled the action, so right now it cannot shoot, the safety is disabled. You can't put it on safety when it's not cocked. And that's the same with the ARs and the same with the handguns. Uh, once it's not cocked, so you can't pull the trigger, the safety is, I, kinda, I guess you call it, it's disabled. Uh, the next one up would be a 22. Now, the majority of 22s are going to come as a bolt gun like this. Like the Remington 1022 is like the most popular 22. They've been around forever, extremely reliable. But they're going to be, uh, they're going to be a bolt gun like this. It's going to be a single shot. 
22 long rifle. My 22 long rifle is actually in the AR platform. It is a um, Smith and Wesson M&P 1522. So this is a 22 long rifle. It holds 25 rounds. Most 22 semi-autos are use a 25 round magazine. So this one is uh, 25 plus one. Uh, because it's an AR platform, it gives you, a, I put a tactical light on here. It's got a laser light. And uh, it's got the uh, canted iron sights. Because of the optic here, as you can see, maybe. It has both, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, it has both the red and green reticles on it, but that uses a battery, so if that battery dies, then I've got the, the uh, canted 45 degree iron sights on it, so again, I'm left-handed, but the iron sights, they don't, they're not left-handed, they're right-handed, so I have to, if I was to, uh, if I was to be using this and realize that my battery died, so all I've got is a piece of glass and nothing to use as a as a uh, as a uh, point of reference for where my bullet's going to be going, then I would have to cant it and use these iron sights. But again, I would have to switch to the right hand and cant it like this and use these sights. So these are these are backup in case the battery ever goes out. Now the 22 is basically for small game. This is for squirrels, rabbits, stuff like that. Mostly it's going to be ground and tree based game. You're not going to probably be hitting anything that's flying with this. And anything larger than a raccoon, I wouldn't really recommend this. It's probably going to take multiple shots or, or a really well placed headshot. So um, I love the 22 long rifle. It's a great firearm. It has. It just has less practical purposes. This is not a home defense gun. This would just, I would not, no. But they're fun to play with and there's zero recoil. Literally the recoil on this, if this was, if there were live rounds and I was actually shooting and I was pulling the trigger, this is how much kick you would see. I mean, I literally, it doesn't, there's nothing and literally nothing. And it's as loud, like a black cat firecracker, it's less loud than that. I mean, so these are really good starter guns for uh, for kids who are you know getting their first firearm. I would highly recommend getting a, a 22, 22 long rifle, like the Smith and Wesson M&P 1522 or a 1022 Remington. These are starter guns, but people that know firearms and have a lot of experience, there's practical uses for this, and I would say it's not necessary it's just a nice thing to have if you've got everything else that you need next is the shotgun um, this one is a uh, Mossberg 500c I'm a Mossberg guy because um, for a lot of reasons but one of them is I really like the position of the safety on a Mossberg most shotguns the safety is going to be right here on the behind the trigger guard um, I really like Again, you can keep your sight pitcher and take it off safety. Again, if you're right-handed the way most people are, you can do it without without moving uh, your finger or losing your sight pitcher. I like this a lot. The only downside to this one is it's a 20 gauge, so uh, the shells are less likely to come by than uh, uh, the 12 gauge. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about why I chose some of the uh, calibers I have, such as the 9mm and the uh, 223556 and the 22, not so much with the, tw the 20 gauge and the 30 out 6, but in a shit is the fan situation, if you come across, let's face it, if you come across people who are deceased and they were carrying a firearm at the time, you're going to want to. Uh, under no circumstance would I leave their uh, either their magazines or any ammo that I you know if it's an ammo box or whatever they're not using it anymore I'm gonna be using it and uh, rather than taking 
um, let's say they've got uh, a 223 uh, magazines full of uh, 223 rounds instead of taking their AR and their magazines you can just grab the magazines if you've got an AR um, pilfering is going to be done a lot if you've got people in your group uh, if you don't have at least one AR per person obviously you come across somebody deceased with an AR uh, if for no other reason than for parts, I would take an AR occasionally. Might not want to take every AR you come across. You're going to end up with a, a lot to deal with and a lot of weight. And you're going to have to store those somewhere. And if you ever relocate, you and whoever you're with is going to have a lot of stuff to transport. So you might want to keep it you know, down to one or two ARs per person and maybe a spare parts uh, bin where you've got um, you know, uh, bolt carriers and stuff for... Uh, replacement parts um, most ARs like with mine most people kind of customize them to the way they like them and then they're very uh, they're very picky because they, they, that's my AR I customize it the way I like and they pick up another one and there's all these things about it they don't like and that's one of the benefits to an AR is the fact that it's very customizable so um, scavenging other found ARs a lot of it I, for me it would be for like bolt carrier groups and uh, charging handles and stuff for uh, spare parts to get my AR up and running were something to happen to it. But again, the 223.556 and the 22 long rifle, the 9mm, these are rounds you're going to come across in a shit hits the fan if you stumble upon ammo. The odds are greater that it's going to be one of those calibers, something that's more widespread. If, you, if your pistol is like a 40 caliber, or 45 you're probably not going to stumble upon that kind of ammo as often as you are going to come across a cache of nine millimeter <clears throat> so that's something you might want to consider and then lastly as far as the firearms that i brought out here is the uh the ar-15 chambered in 223 and 556 um, the reason i recommend if you your first gun if you go with a handgun to get a semi-auto pistol is because the mechanics of how a semi-automatic pistol works is very similar to how the mechanics on an AR works. Uh, unlike a bolt gun or a shotgun or a revolver, the semi-auto pistol and the AR-15 have a similar mechanism in how they work. The AR-15 again is one of those where you you know you can't pop the magazine and say, "Yep, it's unloaded. Here you go," because there was one in the chamber. So you want to uh, be aware of that. And once there is, you know, you can check it just like you do with the uh, semi-auto handgun. You look in there and make sure it's good to go. Make sure it's on fire so I can dry fire it. And again, as with the handgun, see it's, it's not charged because there wasn't another round to feed in there to recycle the bolt. So right now it can't, the, the trigger cannot be pulled. So you cannot put it on safety. If I was to cycle it, now I can put it on safety. So if you ever have an AR and you try and it's on fire and you want to put it on safety and it, it won't move, it's simply because the, uh, the bolt hasn't been cycled. So you're not able to actually put it on safety. There's some parts to an AR that you can become familiar with if you really want to know. Uh, you've got the dust cover here, you've got the forward assist, you've got the charging handle. The bolt carrier group is this inside piece here uh, that actually shoves the round forward and ejects it after uh, each round is fired. Um, safety is generally right here. Again, for a lefty, I've gotten to where I'm pretty good with this. I just, but again, I have to take my, uh, my trigger finger and move it a little bit to turn that on and off as far as the safety goes. Uh, I believe it can it can be taken off and put to the other side. I just haven't done it, and I probably will at some point move the safety to the other side, uh, or buy one that's ambidextrous where there's one on each side. Um, the magazine release is only on the right side. Um, which isn't that bad of a deal as a lefty because if a lot of times people will hold the AR like this and it's not that big of a stretch for me just to pop that off 
So not that big a deal. But again, with the AR, they're customizable. I've got the optics. I've got backup in case, again, if the battery dies, even though this, is, this one here has a black reticle without power and blue, red, or I think even green. I mean, this, the, the instruction said blue, red, or green. I've only seen blue and red, but maybe I need to twist this a lot further around. Maybe once I get past a certain brightness on one of the colors, it changes to green. I haven't seen the green, but apparently it's on there. But there's the backup iron sights to use in case um, something happens to the optics. Uh, they break. Um, this is glass, so it could get broken. You have to pull this off and go to your backup iron sights. Um, <clears throat> the foregrip is uh, it's just a personal preference. I like having that foregrip for stability. Some people don't like them. This one here in particular, it's a metal, it's got a quick release and the bottom comes off so I can stick things in here such as uh, tools to work on an AR. Uh, I could put matches with a, a striker in there. I could put a ferro rod, um, band-aids, I don't know, whatever, fish hook and some line, whatever you can think of, you wouldn't mind putting in there, that's fine. Um, one thing about what firearm you, you select, um, again, the shotgun is going to be for a wide range of uh, game, especially the ones that can fly away from you. That's going to be the difference between eating and not eating. Shotgun, I definitely recommend. The 22 long rifle, again, I would say if you have kids and you want to get them into firearms, start with that. Bolt gun, that's for large game and sniping, let's be honest. That's for uh, long distance shooting and uh, big game like uh, deer, bear, whatever. Something large. Um, you can. This definitely has the overkill factor. If you shot even like a javelina with a 30 out six, there's a good chance you're going to ruin a good chunk of that of the meat on that because 30 out six. Uh, we actually have a round comparison. So here's. The 223 5.56 round is visually, you can't really tell the difference. They're going to be this size. 30 out 6 is going to be a much larger round. Clearly, uh, this does uh, present the possibility of overkill if you're hunting for game. There's uh, certain size animals you probably don't want to hit with this because it's going to it's going to pretty much ruin a lot of the meat. But uh, as you can see, the 30 out 6 is a much much larger round than the 223 or the 556. Now, if your concern is not living off the land, shooting, you know, fowl or, you know, grouse, pigeon, pheasant, that kind of thing, or self-defense with an AR or shooting big animals, if you're looking at home defense, again, the handgun is your best bet. I'll go with the one with the light on it. <clears throat> Because of, you know, you wake up at 3 in the morning and you hear someone's in your house. With, with the handgun, you can, you're going to be dealing with corners. Corners are going to be the biggest obstacle you come across. It's your house. You know where all the furniture and everything is. It's the corners. So you're going to use the corners for cover. And you want that, if you have an AR-15 in your house, you're in close quarters, you're going to have to walk around with it down. You're not going to be able to walk around your house. Well, I mean, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it because uh, you got a corner here. The barrel's coming around that corner long before you are. So you're going to give away your position. You see this barrel coming out, and then by the time you swing around, they see that you're there. So this is not ideal for in, in your house. But, yeah, it'll work. But if you got a corner here and you come up on it, you don't want to, you see in movies a lot where the person's walking around like this and there's like a door and they walk into a room and then of course the karate chop comes down, knocks the gun out of their hand because the gun was in the room two seconds before they were. Obviously that's not how you want to come into to a room. You want to come in and you know, you're know you going to use the door frame here as cover and you're going to do what's called slicing the pie. You're going to look, you're going to divide the room into sections. Look around the door. You know, you just don't want to. This is such a better option for in your house because you can just keep it close to you. 
look around corners, you know, and you, you just don't have that big, so many things to go wrong with a long barrel sticking out where you swing it and you knock over a lamp or you bump it and make noise with your, with your handgun for, uh, and again, this is a 15 plus one. So I've got 16 rounds here. This is a 12 plus one, and this is a 17 plus one. So you're going to have plenty of rounds to, to work with. If, if see, this, so this is 16 rounds total. If somebody's in your house and you know, and you get into it with them, I really hope you can hit them within 16 rounds. Get to where you're provisioned enough. Don't waste ammo. Don't fire warning shots. Don't get silly. Don't do like shit on TV. When you get into it, uh, honestly, I don't even think I would give them a verbal warning. If I if I heard somebody in my house and let's say I came around and I looked and it's a couple of people that aren't supposed to be there, I don't recognize them. I'm probably not going to say hands up or or even turning on the light to spook them and then start yelling at them. Honestly, I'm probably just going to open fire on them. I mean, they they made that choice to enter the house that wasn't theirs, and whatever happens to them from that point on is, is their problem. So. So Jack Hammer Mike made that video, and like I said, I watched it. It's about 54, 55 minutes long, and uh, it got me thinking. Uh, there's a lot of really good information there. Again, I agree with him that the uh, first gun you buy probably should be a handgun, and for a couple of reasons. One is, like you said, the concealability, but also the mechanics of it. If you get a semi-auto, the mechanics of a uh, semi-auto uh, handgun are very similar to the mechanics of an AR-15. And if you're interested in buying firearms and you do go out and you get a, a semi-auto handgun first, I can almost guarantee you this is going to be the next one you buy because you're going to get addicted and then you're going to go, oh, the pistol's fun, but I want to bump it up a notch. And that's this is definitely where you want to go um, is the AR-15. There's many reasons why this is the most popular gun in the United States. Um, and again, you can customize it. Like I said, I've got the... The grip sleeve on here, the optics, the foregrip, the sling. I think that's all I've done to this. I haven't done that much. Smith & Wesson makes a really good gun. You can get these in the $400 to $500 range. Um, again, I think I paid somewhere between $380 and like $410 or $420 for this. Brand new, out of the box. You can get these. They do put them on sale. You don't have to pay out the nose for an AR. Uh, the Smith & Wesson isn't the only one. There's a few other uh, brands that are very good ARs that uh, will not break the bank. Shotguns, like again, I would probably say <laughs> a shotgun I would use, this would probably be my third firearm purchase. I'd get a handgun, an AR, and then I'd get a shotgun. Or you can flip-flop and go handgun, shotgun, AR. But these three is what I would call must-haves at some point in your collection. You have to have, in my opinion, semi-auto handgun, an AR, and a shotgun. After that, with the large caliber bolt gun and uh, the 22, unless you're buying a gun for um, a child to teach him, you know, basic firearm safety, and you know, you want to buy them their own, their own firearm, then I would start them with the 22 because the mechanics on, especially the Smith & Wesson, the mechanics on this are identical to the uh, AR-15. So the only difference they're going to have once they graduate is the round size, the noise, and the kick. Other than that, the way it functions is going to be exactly the same. So they're already going to know all the mechanics on how to operate the AR-15 when they finally graduate to that. So I think that's pretty much it. I wanted to touch on um, like shit hits the fan gun versus home defense gun. And in both cases, I agree with Mike that the... Uh, semi-auto pistol would be the uh, ideal first choice for your first gun. Um, my everyday carry is usually the PT-111 because it's a subcompact, it is so small. Um, sometimes I carry this, usually I just carry this in a holster when I'm out in the desert, like with camp contingency. More often than not, if I'm out in the desert and I've got a holster and we're going on a walk or whatever, it's the Smith & Wesson and then my the PT247G2. This one is my 
um, vehicle gun. This one's always in my car. Um, and again, this is the only ambidextrous one I have. Um, so I keep it in my car. Um, I've always kept this in my car, but with the constitutional carry here, we can always carry one on us. Depending on where I'm going, sometimes I just don't want the... I just don't want it on me. Sometimes I just don't like carrying them because they're not comfortable. Or here it gets really, really hot, and uh, so people tend to dress, uh, dress down in the summer when it's 112 degrees. You don't wear a lot of clothing, and sometimes it's just difficult to conceal a handgun real well. So I just have this in my car so I can get to it if I need to. But that's pretty much it. Get, uh, get a semi-auto handgun first. Learn the mechanics of it. Again, like I said, uh, if you've got a round indicator on top here, like right now this is telling me there is no round in the chamber. And you don't have to, it's not visual, you just feel it like that. I know that this thing is not cocked and loaded. I can pull the trigger, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it does have a safety on it. I generally don't use the safety at all. Uh, sometimes I'll put it on safety if I'm just storing it in my room or something and I'm not going to be messing with it for a while. I put the safety on and just, you know, put it away. No reason. It's just sort of a habit. I'll just put in case, I guess it's from my past in case someone ever, you know, was visiting or at my house and said, oh, look, and pulled this out. It's just that one more level of security that if somebody were to get their hands on this and pull the trigger, it would be on safety. But um, if, if it's a situation where only I'm going to have access to these, I don't mess with the safety generally. Um, I do on the shotgun sometimes keep it on safety. If I'm walking, if I'm out walking around, or if I have it slung on me, I will keep it on safe just because um, the shotgun has a really big trigger guard, very wide open. It would be relatively easy for a twig or something especially when we're out in the desert walking around for something to get in there and hook on there. We walk through a lot of, you know, crappy brush and stuff, and it would be very easy for something to hook onto here. The AR I generally wear in front like this. The shotgun I will usually sling over my back. So I'll leave this on safety just to, just for negligent, just to prevent a negligent discharge. Um, the 30 out 6 uh, same thing. I do generally keep this on safety. Um, just because, well, for one reason, the round is so damn devastating. I, I do not want this accidentally going off because this would, you don't want this going off accidentally. It's like a, it's a bazooka. Just, but uh, I don't use it that often, so there's no reason. It's not a home defense gun. I'm not going to run to that and grab it if I think somebody's in the house. So I keep it on safety and, and keep it in a case, and I don't break it out very often. Uh, I probably shot that. 25 times total and uh, because being a lefty it's very difficult to shoot this left-handed because of the very awkward it's built for a right-hander and uh, I like I've mentioned before I have a torn rotator cuff on my right shoulder this thing is like somebody walking up to you and just punching you right in the shoulder so I can't fire this a lot in a I've got the scope zeroed and I'm happy with that. I can hit, you know, a four inch spot from a hundred yards or more. I'm not worried about that. I've got it zeroed. Probably not going to shoot it much unless uh, there's a cow or a bear, which I don't know about bears here. Probably no bear. Uh, unless there's something very large on the other end. I, or if somebody comes out here and they've never shot one and they want to, I'll, I'll take it out to the desert and they can shoot it. But um, I really have no plans to shoot that one any, any more than I have to. The 22 long rifle. Another benefit is uh, ammo's dirt cheap. I don't know if you can see the rounds. Very small and lightweight. You can carry these things. You can carry a ton of them. I think I've only got... I've got somewhere between four and six magazines for this. These. Magazines aren't real hard to get. You can get them online, and you can get them. Most um, most firearm stores will have 22 long rifle AR magazines. Uh, again, they're 25 round magazines. They're very easy to load because they have this built-in uh, spring assist where you basically just 
pull down, insert around, pull down, insert around, pull down. It's real easy to load these. Um, kind of a built-in speed loader. Uh, so that's pretty much it. I just wanted to do uh, a video that sort of touched on the things that uh, Mike's video made me think about. Um, again, home defense, I would definitely go with a handgun, semi-auto, just because of uh, it, it, it's just going to make life easier for you. Again, with the AR-15 and the handgun, especially rounds where you miss, know your backdrop because these things are they're going to keep going. Um, like Mike said, they're going to enter your neighbor's house possibly or your kid's bedroom down the hall. Uh, one thing you may want to consider is if you're going to you know, put down some intruder or get them on their way out or whatever your plan is, um, you might want to wait until they get to a spot that you've predetermined is the best ambush point to where your backdrop is safe because with these two platforms, the, the, the handgun and the AR, even if you hit them, there's a good chance the bullet's going to keep going. So know your backstop. Shotgun, less of an issue, but again, that's really very uh, unwieldy to come around corners and, and it's just it, it, it gives a, there's a lot of real estate here for a bad guy to grab and, and, and cause a struggle so again I would not recommend that I would I would try and keep it to something that you can keep close to your body and uh, yeah so those are just some thoughts um, definitely learn the mechanics that's I would say the number one thing Again, a revolver is easy. It's just it's just got the wheel. You pop, roll, you know, flip it out. And there's no bullets in it. Pretty, pretty much safe. Um, the bolt gun. It's very, it's very rudimentary. Uh, shotguns. Most, as I said on the the Mossberg, the safety is here by your thumb up on top. Most of them are down here. Um, when a shotgun does not have any rounds in it, you can't pump it. There's a release here you can push that will allow you, and most shotguns it is, it's right here next to the trigger. You push up and then that's how you check for rounds in a shotgun. That's how you check in a shotgun to see if it's loaded. You can open it just a little to see if you see the shell here. You can also look here, because when you put one in, you can see the end here, the primer. If you look, you can see it. But in the dark, that's probably not going to work. So one way, well, being quiet is not something you really need to worry about too much, because uh, you really can't be quiet with a shotgun, because every time you rack it, it's going to make a lot of noise. That's called the pucker factor. Um, if someone is on your property meaning to do you harm and they hear this, sometimes that alone will get them to change their mind on their next move. So other than that, I think we're done. So for those of you who uh, have a lot of experience with uh, firearms, this video is probably a waste of time. But for those who are new or considering getting their first gun, I hope something in here helped. Okay, thank you, good night, peace. I can see clear.